you are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 433. When given an opportunity, deliver excellence and never quit. Robert Rodriguez. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a profitable business. It's harder today than ever before for independent filmmakers to make money with their films, from predatory film distributors ripping them off to huckster film aggregators who prey upon them. The odds are stacked against the indie filmmaker. The old distribution model of making money with your film is broken and there needs to be a change. The future of independent filmmaking is the entrepreneurial filmmaker or the film entrepreneur. In Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, I break down how to actually make money with your film projects and show you how to turn your indie film into a profitable business. With case studies examining successes and failures, this book shows you the step-by-step method to turn your passion into a profitable career. If you're making a feature film, series, or any other kind of video content, the Film Entrepreneur method will set you up for success. The book is available in paperback, ebook, and of course, audiobook. If you want to order it, just head over to www.filmbizbook.com. That's film, B-I-Z, book.com. And today's show is also sponsored by the Heart Chart Screenwriting Masterclass taught by legendary screenwriter James V. Hart, the writer of Bram Stoker's Dracula, Hook, and Contact, to name a few. His unique story mapping system will teach you how to get your script ready for production and the marketplace. To gain instant access, head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash heart chart. That's H-A-R-T chart. Now, guys, today on the show, we have John Hess from Filmmaker IQ. Now, I've been a fan of John's work for years. Filmmaker IQ is an amazing website with these remarkable mini documentaries that he puts up on YouTube. And and he just shows you everything from how to make air-powered blub squibs to the history of the mockbuster, the fundamental elements of film music, who's in a movie credits, the science of deep focus and hyperfocal distance. I mean, the history of the Hollywood musical. He goes deep into each topic he covers. And they are so entertaining, so well-produced, I just love what John has been doing over the years. He is definitely an OG in this space of helping filmmakers follow their dreams and make their movies. So I I just had an absolute ball talking to John on the show. I can't wait to share this episode with you. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with John Hess. I'd like to welcome to the show the legendary... John Hess from Filmmaker IQ. Thank you, John, for being on the show, butter. Hi, thank you for having me. I appreciate it, man. I mean, listen, I've been, uh, like I was telling you earlier, I have been a big fan of Filmmaker IQ and what you do. You have a very unique voice and and how you approach the filmmaking process uh, and the work that you do with Filmmaker IQ uh, than anybody else in our space. And uh, I've been an admirer from a distance for quite some time. You are, I, I like to call you, well, there's a few of you guys, but like the OGs. You're one of the OGs. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> one of the original gangsters uh, doing this because it started in 08, right? Uh, yeah, the site started in 08, I believe. Yeah, I guess so. And I haven't really <laughs> got thought about that. <laughs> um, but it was at the tail end of the MySpace era. So if you want to put a context oh, to that. Oh, I, oh yeah. I made a lot of money on MySpace selling my independent film. I was, it was, I was huge on MySpace. Huge. <laughs> MySpace was, I mean, we're, if we were talking like a bunch of, uh, old, old guys sitting around talking about Shit. the old days. Yeah. yeah. But, but yeah, MySpace was kind of how I got into the whole discussing film online. Mm-hmm. And it was the through the MySpace film forums. That's really kind of how IQ started. It was born there. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a long story behind it. I don't know if you want to get into it, but it's, it basically was uh, we wanted we were kind of kicked off of MySpace. <laughs> so we were both my, my friend and I, Dennis was we were both banned from MySpace, and we said, Why? "Hey, let's start our own site." Because uh, 
we for the longest time we didn't have moderate moderates moderators on on uh, on the film forums and then we've been clamoring let's get some moderators because there's probably people in here spamming constantly mm-hmm. well my friend Dennis was uh would always post very interesting articles but he would bump the posts up to get them back to the top he would post an article but he would bump it up and that was against the rules you know the moderators so they banned him one of the, one of the more you know important assets of the film forums was banned because he would bump up his old posts and that's and so he said and I fought for him, and and I got banned as well. And uh, <laughs> to hell with MySpace, and we went off to do our own site. Well, and so and and arguably story. that worked out for you, okay? Because uh, <laughs> we, not many people talk about MySpace anymore. Um, is it still? Around? I know it is still on. It's still around, it's right? It's Still on for I guess there's some bands that use it, you know, or some some music in the music scene still kind of uses it. Yeah, but yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't it's, think it's, SoundCloud is probably bigger than that. that oh, point. way more. No, yeah, no, I, I, I mean, this is probably dead. Yeah, and I think uh, was it who who bought a Fox? Fox paid like a billion for it. Mm-hmm. Um, that was Murdoch really- back in the day. Yeah, Tom Anderson had a nice little payday because everybody's friend. Remember, if you remember Tom, back my- Tom, Tom. So, um, <laughs> so before we get going, man, how did you get into the business? How did you get into the to loving what you do? Oh, well, you know. Uh, it's, it's to say you love it, you know, it's, it's, it's complicated to say you love what you do. I mean, I, I love it so much that I'm willing to put up with all the crap that I do. Amen, brother. It. Preach. You know, that's, it's not that I love, I, every, I love every single waking day moment. No, I, I, I honestly am frustrated half the time, but I wouldn't do it if I wasn't, if I was that, if I didn't love it, I'd be doing something else. So I started off, I, I made, uh, I made little videos and I grew up, I was class of 2000. So I grew up in the late nineties. And I made little videos for my uh, for my high school. We just is a budding, you know, uh, TV video production class. And I started doing just little projects, av- advertising on the morning announcements because we had a closed circuit television back in those days. Uh, advertising the academic decathlon team. So I started making uh, spoofs of things. I made like a like a silent film spoof. I made a Titanic, which was really big back then. Spoof. I uh, made a Mission Impossible spoof, which is again another movie franchise from the late '90s, and I kind of like I started falling in love with the whole process of just making moving pictures. It's kind of like a, that's if you if you've read if you heard Spielberg talk about how he got started, how when he was a kid he had the the little eight eight millimeter camera and he would shoot two trains running into each other, and, and he learned he could just shoot it and watch it over and over again. That's kind of the same way I got into into video making or filmmaking is just I like creating things and just watching them over and over again. I kind of fell in love with that. Um, but as a kid, I always wanted to be in business. I, I've always, because my father was international engineering, so I was always involved with some sort of, bi- I always loved the air of business. So I went to school to be a business major, and I found I, I still like business, but I was like, ah, I still want to make videos. That's still what I want to do. So about my second year of, of college, I decided, hey, I'm going to go uh, intern at, I want to see if I can make the, marry the two, become a business and and uh, and video, maybe do maybe like a producer and film. So I found a uh, a um, small cable company that was out in uh, Corona, California, and they were doing commercials, like local local cable commercials. You know, it was really bad uh, <laughs> Cal Worthington kind of stuff. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. So I interned there for like a year. Like I just just did it because and like I didn't even take class credit because I, I was like ah, I don't want to do the paperwork <laughs> for the credit. I just wanted to be there and hang out and do like little these little movies, uh, not movies, little commercials. I did that for a year, and uh, I, I mean I'm going more detail than I probably need to, but I did that for a year and then I was laid off <laughs> by the company and my the people that I worked with were laid off and I, and it kind of burned in me this like this little independent streak. Like, man, these guys I know work for the company for 25 years. They built a family. They, they depend on this job. And the, the corporate culture comes in and just kind of axes them. And I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to go work for the man. <laughs> so I just when I decided to start doing my own business. Uh, and that was about 20 years ago or eight, 18 years ago, 17, 18 years ago. And what was so that I've business? Doing, and what was that business? Oh, what, what do you mean? My own business? Just yeah. Video production. Okay. So any, like any kind of video production. In fact, I do, uh, that's primarily what I do. I mean, the the film, well, narrative filmmaking is something that I I, I want to aspire to more. Mm-hmm. But right now, I'm actually doing a ton of, of video work for like I do I do work for cities and um, corporate corporate corporations that call me in to do like a like a like a documentary about you know their corporate culture or whatever they want to promote. Mm-hmm. So I so I ended up still using that business education of mine, the business marketing. 
but I make uh, commercials and stuff like that. So filmmaker IQ more was a side kind of like a side hustle for and more of a mm-hmm. labor of love for for yeah it's, I mean it's, it's honestly a labor of love kind of thing it's I mean I like to kind of push it more toward an actual uh, productive income generating stream but it's, it really is still more of a labor of love and I don't know it's it's one of those things where I don't want to I don't want to kill it by making it too much of a of a job necessarily <laughs> although I do want to do something to you know I do want to actually make it to be be more of a job, I guess. Right. If you want to call it that. I mean, I mean, I guess I'm being very candid and honest. So all the people <laughs> are breaking their spells about who I am and what I do. Well, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of, you know, and I've been doing this, um, for, for five years and I, and I still, I still say that I have the original filmmaking tutorial on YouTube. Uh, mm-hmm. it was in 2005. I put up behind the scenes of my short film <laughs> that's still up mm-hmm. there. So I was one of the first to do that, but I never kept going with it. So a couple other yeah. guys like film riot and Ryan and those guys did mm-hmm. it and rocket jump and those guys. Um, but uh, a lot of people think that they have a different perception. Like I, th- because of how good you do what you do, the perception of what you do is like, Oh, he's just, you know, this is, this is amazing. And he's just, killing it and he's just rolling in it and it's like and a lot of people yeah. and a lot of people think that of me as well like oh he must be just kill i'm like yeah, you know what i make a, I make i do okay i do okay yeah but I, but but i'm not scrooge mcducking it anytime <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly uh, you know i even I, I mean i may be even wrong but like i don't i think even someone like martin scorsese who is all in terms of purposes hugely successful <laughs> yeah. he still has trouble he still has problems making the movie he wants to make half the time. You know, he's always complaining, like, I can't get the money to do this. Well, to be, to be fair, you know, to be fair, Marty's not going after two, two or three hundred thousand dollars. He's going after two hundred exactly. million to make a movie yeah. that doesn't have a lot of marketability. You have that, you know, you just hit on exactly how I feel about the situation. <laughs> yeah. If he would just go for like a ten million dollar movie, you know, get some people he's never worked with before. He could uh, he could get that money in an instant. Yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, there's, there's different, like Spike Lee, uh, Woody Allen, uh, and those kind of, I mean, Woody, you know, regardless of his personal life as a filmmaker, he did something that I don't think there is another filmmaker of his generation did. He made a movie a year for like 30 yeah. years. Um, yeah. and he always kept his budget because he knew his art, his films had a specific, audience that could generate a certain amount of money and he would be able to attract huge stars to come in and work scale for him because Mm -hmm. he was who he was and he built that kind of system up for himself and i don't think i mean maybe clint is another guy that i would throw in that but that's just a different that's a different generation that's a whole different other world yeah but that's what they they were smart even clint like you know he did that what was that last movie he did with um Oh, the bomber. Richard Jewell. Yeah, Richard, Richard Jewell. Jewell. Yeah, Richard. I can't. I don't think Richard Jewell costs 150. I don't think no. that. Co- no, no, it did cost 150. Because Clinton knows, like, you know, I'm going to make a movie about Richard Jewell, and it's called Richard Jewell. Like, people are like, what? <laughs> Who else in Hollywood in a studio a sh- is making Richard Jewell? <laughs> With a schlubby lead actor, it's like I'm going to put a schlubby guy in the front. Who no one's who no one's know. Who no one knows. Like it's not a face that people recognize. Yeah. So, but he's Clint. But he's smart. Like there's a there's a there's a a budget range that makes sense for that movie. Marty still hasn't figured that out yet. No, <laughs> you know that's it, it, it's funny that you're articulating like one. I feel like I was a lone voice back when uh, what's the movie that Martin Irishman finished. Irishman, yeah. like Irishman costs almost as much as Spider-Man Homecoming, you know, like <laughs> how can you, and it's, that's, that should be like if people will, well, that's because we spent too much money on comic book movies. Well, there's a bigger audience for the comic book movie, you know, mm-hmm. it's Spider-Man. So I, I don't know, that, 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 that whole thing was, you could just smell the, the marketing. You, that's I guess, cause no, I'm a business major. You could feel it, you know, coming at you. No, exactly. And if you look at, I mean, if you look at someone like Nolan, who also, you know, has a very expensive palette, but his films are for a very broad audience. Even though, yeah. like, Inception, <laughs> it makes my head hurt. It makes everyone's head hurt. Like right. thinking about the plotting in that film is. It's pretty insane, but for whatever, but he brings in action. He brings in star. Mm-hmm. Like he, he understands his art form very well. Where Fincher has a little bit of that Scorsese vibe to him, which is like, you know, yeah. I really, I really need 150 million, but and be like Fincher, we love you, man, but 
I, 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 we can't. <laughs> yeah, no. I, I love I love the fact that we're talking about this because it, it, it you know like so much of what I see online is kind of like just give give these guys two hundred give Martin Scorsese two hundred million dollars because he deserves it. It's like that's not how. Yeah, that's, well, that's not business. Put your money into it first. <laughs> if you had two hundred money, put your put your dollar up into it. You know? like no. So everyone we're talking about here, we're all talking about giants. So Martin, you know, right. Marty and, and, and Nolan and Fincher and all these kind of guys. They're, they're just giants. They're, they live on Mount Hollywood. I call it Mount Hollywood where, <laughs> right. where, where, where the, they're the gods, the Olympic, they're uh, the Greek gods of, of Hollywood. Um, and, and we're just the peasants throwing up stones and I'm not throwing up stones yeah. at all because I'm huge fans of all of them. And believe me, if, if it was up to me, I would give Marty $500 million because I would love to see what he does with that. Mm-hmm. But the reality is that on a business standpoint, it makes no sense. You, you have to, you have to have, if you're going to create a product and I know a lot of filmmakers out there are going to go, film's not a product. I hate to tell you it is. It is. So if you're going to have a product, that product has to have a cost and there has to be an ROI, a return on investment. Now, if you want to do art films, you make that $5 million or that Woody Allen budget range film and do whatever the hell you want. Like whatever you want because you'll make your money back because the ROI on a film like that makes sense for a, ca- mm-hmm. a filmmaker of that caliber. But if not, then no. Like look, Spielberg – couldn't get Lincoln financed, you know. Yeah, it's Steven Spielberg with Daniel Day Lewis as a star, and couldn't get financing for for Lincoln. If Mar- if if Steve, and then the reason why he couldn't get that was because the ROI essentially didn't look like who's going to go see a, a movie about and, Lincoln and, and like how, and, what's the budget range? Is it going to make sense? And the and the way Spielberg was selling this movie Lincoln, he was saying this is going to be a courtroom drama about the Fourteenth Amendment. <laughs> So it wasn't great marketing at all. <laughs> that's that's like, oh yeah, that's summer block. That's a popcorn movie right there, right? <laughs> right. But so even so, someone like one of the greatest filmmakers of all time, one of the most successful filmmakers of all time, couldn't get financing for a film. And it wasn't like he was asking for Marty numbers, because Marty, you know, is Marty. Um yeah. but he was still asking for, you know, 70, 80 million, 90 million um to make this kind of period piece film. It took it had to go to India. To get the money. (laughs) And they were just like, they were just happy to be making a movie with Spielberg. They're like, here, here's a check. And it worked out for him. And now Netflix is doing the same thing with Marty. I think he's, they're doing his next movie with Leonardo DiCaprio. So, Mm -hmm. but they're, that business model is different though. Irishman made sense in the Netflix ecosystem. Uh huh. It made, it made all the sense in the world to to, to spend 150, $180 million in the Netflix ecosystem. In the Hollywood studio system, it makes absolutely no sense. It's just not fine. It's just makes no sense. Would you agree? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't know much. I don't know enough about the Netflix world. I mean, to me, the Netflix streaming stuff is still so speculative. Uh, we, there, no one knows exactly what the numbers are. I mean, and then they purposely hide that. So, I don't know. I mean, there, but I, know, I just know that Netflix is raising so much capital to make new properties. And part of me is like, well, why can't I get a piece of that action? <laughs> um, but it's, yeah. It, well, if, you know, if we could go, we could go down the Netflix uh, a hole in a se- for, for a second, which from okay. what I'm hearing about Netflix is well, I know for a fact that they're extremely in debt. Uh, extremely oh, okay. yeah. in debt because they've just they've had this kind of don't forget they were not a studio they're a mm-hmm. they're a, a Silicon Valley startup so they looked mm-hmm. they brought their entire business model as a Silicon Valley startup meaning spend a lot of money lose money for a long time to gain market share and then right. you'll be brought at the Amazon model the Facebook model every big you know, Airbnb model all of those kind of models then it became a studio afterwards but you know, they're, they're, I don't know, man. It, it, everything's just like we were talking about earlier is like, it doesn't, from what outside we look like we're Scrooge McDucking it. Netflix is the same thing. I think a lot of people have a different perception of Netflix as like, oh, they're just killing it. They're, they're hurting. They're hurting. I don't know yeah. if you know, I don't know if you knew it or not, but, and this is now we're getting into a little bit of tech geek stuff. Sure. Since the pandemic, Netflix has been extremely hurting because more people are watching Netflix. Yeah. So the, the 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 load on their servers and the technology and the cost of that has I think tripled. But there are no new subscribers to can't to 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 offset that. So that's just exi- so now they're just like, oh man, we've got this. Everyone's watching Netflix now. 
great. Unfortunately, our business model is not set up for that. We just want a few people to be watching Netflix and pay for it, but don't watch it. And that's that's what happened. So they actually started throttling. I don't know if you knew that they started throttling the image quality just a bit because if they drop it five percent, that could be millions of dollars in service fees. Right. So that that's what's uh, that's that's one of the things enough. But I but, but enough about I buy it. No, yeah, I, I, I think you're right. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting to think about it you know, because yeah like people people who are losing their jobs are not getting new netflix subscriptions no so and, and there is a, have them. and there's also um a critical a uh, level of critical mass when yeah. there are no more subscribers that they can get but mm-hmm. yet they're going to have to keep spending irishman style money for projects to keep what they have because now disney's out and and i, I want actually want that brings me to mm-hmm. a, another question i want to hear i want to talk to you about you know Disney Plus and the whole COVID situation and what happened, and you know Disney is already at over sixty million as of this recording subscribers, which it got in wow. less than a year. It's insane. <laughs> now they're doing Mulan, so they're skipping uh-huh. theatrical. What do you think about that whole yeah. thirty dollar? You've got to be a member of Disney Plus to watch it, and it's an experiment. It's literally they're doing a hundred and fifty million dollar experiment, which is what I was saying. When everyone was talking about Trolls 2, like, oh, Trolls 2 killed it. I'm like, dude, it's Trolls 2. It was the first like <laughs> month of the quarantine. Everybody, there's kids at home. Nobody knew what to do. Of course, they're going to spend 20 bucks on Trolls 2. But I want to see a tentpole. Mulan is a tentpole. What, mm-hmm. what do you, what do you, what do you think is going to happen? What do, what's your thoughts on it? Oh, that's a, you know, it's, it's, one of, I, I hate the, the, the cliche. It'd be interesting to see because I, it's like, you can say that about everything. Um, I, I think it will probably be, it'll probably do what this, it's hard to say because we're in such a weird time right now. Um, because we can't go to the movie theaters. So, so theatrical is not even an option for them. Um, as far as, as far as what I think is going to, I mean, I think it's an op, it's, it's an, it's an extra experiment, but I'm not sure you can be repeated in next year. Uh, when theaters do eventually open up again, can you do that? Can you see that same kind of success if people have the option to go back to theater? And again, I know theater is also one of those topics that people are feel is, it's very weird that every time I bring up theater, like on social media, or theatrical on social media, there's a group of people that want to see it die. I don't understand <laughs> why. <laughs> You notice that? I I, mean, I, I I have I have noticed that people are like it's de- and I've 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 even said it I've said it many times I like I think I personally think that the the theatrical experience as we knew it in January 2020 will not return to that level probably ever again we will never have as many screens like that again because it was all going in a downward slow downward trajectory I mean theatrical mm-hmm. a- attendance and things it's just What's happening? And, and regardless if you love it or not, I think there'll always be a theatrical. Like there's there's Broadway plays. Yeah. There's always right. going to be a movie theater. There's always going to be IMAX. There's going to be an exper an experience like that. But um, it's never going to die. People still want to go out and do that. But right. yeah. the business model is going to change. So now. Definitely. Disney could just go, you know what, guys, we're just going to release this for three weeks and then we're going to go straight to Disney Plus. And if you don't like it, we'll just go straight to Disney Plus because we'll probably make enough money to cover that. Well, I mean, I don't know if you followed the the courts just have want to re- uh, overturn that Paramount decree. Mm-hmm. So which I'm I think, you know, people are, are you know, jumping over. Head, like, how can we do this? I think the Paramount decrees are kind of long and done because they were made at a point when movies had no. Movies had only radio as a competition. It was 1948. <laughs> right. You know, fi- television was 50s. So television came in and kind of beat the crap out of movies. Um, and now we've got internet streaming, which let's face it, most people are probably doing instead of watching movies. So the, I think the time for a business model shift is probably here. Um, so like what you're saying was as far as Disney, maybe Disney ends up buying a bunch of theaters where oh. they become like Disney – Disney. Well, like the Egyptian here. No, no, yeah. El Capitan. They have El Capitan here. Yeah, that's Disney. So maybe that happens in like St. Louis now. They have a you know the Disney El Capitan in in in, in uh, St. Louis or wherever Toledo, you know, and then that's all they do is they they show Disney movies. And I'm not a parent, but imagine if you if I was a parent, heck, I would take my kid to the Disney theater once in a while. I mean, it might be something that's worth 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 oh, pursuing. And don't forget, there will be a Disney store. 
inside that Disney theater. <laughs> exactly. I mean, and the, it's so, so for them, it's almost a loss leader to get you in the door to watch the movie because they're going to sell you on other stuff. I mean, it's the truth. And in, the point, yeah. it's the only way, like, I, I agree with you 100%. I think that theaters, uh, someone's going to buy AMC before the year is mm-hmm. out. If not this year, end of next year, or be, be sometime in early next year, someone's going to buy. Amazon's already circling. There's a lot of people with a lot of cash who could mm-hmm. just come in and buy it. And all of a sudden you have how many screens <laughs> all around the country? So, right. and there's, and there's, uh, there's so many regal and all these other things. They're hurting and they're, they're, they're going to be vulnerable for purchase. I agree with you. There's only three major studios that have the power to do anything like that. Uh, that have the financial power to do that, which would be Disney, Warner's, and Universal. But but the big unknowns: Facebook, Cash, <laughs> Google, Amazon, Apple. They have Apple has oh yeah four hundred billion it. cash. <laughs> yeah, hey, just cash. And well, you got an iPhone, <laughs> Apple Store in every theater. Too. <laughs> no, I mean, so that is, but that's the key to this. It's, it's this kind of creating of the, of this ecosystem. The Disney's been, a, I mean, that's what Disney does. Disney, mm-hmm. that's, I mean, their theme parks, their cruises, yeah. their their Disney stores. It's it's what they do. So there's no doubt that there's going to be a Disney chain. I mean, it just makes all the sense in the world. Mm-hmm. And and that, and in a world where we have the internet streaming. I don't see that as a bad thing because it's not. I don't feel like it's stifling competition because mm-hmm. it's not like these indie movies were getting into those big chains anyway. So um, I don't know. Yeah, I, exactly. I don't think you're absolutely right. I mean, yeah, AMC. I mean, I mean, I mean, yeah, some, but not like really indie movies. The theatrical experience for independent film is almost non-existent unless you really are at the top one percent of all independent yeah. films. Whether either you've got a a um uh, a tastemaker like Sundance or South by or, or or an A24 or someone like that neon one of these guys that can kind of come in and elevate elevate the art house vibe um and there are small movies that could do that and you have to really understand how you do marketing and audience building and all that kind of stuff but for like the standard you know hundred thousand yeah and now they're also like these independent wings and these major studios that because I mean if you're if you're Fox Adam or whatever, you know, Searchlight Studios or whatever, you can that that's where you would see some sort of uh you know, if you're partnering with a large studio as far as independent. I mean, I'm not I'm kind of speaking out of my experience there. Yeah. But but, uh, the, but those kind of things have kind of fallen off to the wayside. It's not the yeah. early 90s anymore where everybody like, yeah. you know, Paramount Vantage and Fox Searchlight and and you know, Focus Film, like all of these small little um, independent, oh, independence where the money's at. So of course they all made their independent labels. Um, but so do you think that, so do you think the theatrical experience, would you agree that it's going to be different? Do you think that it's going to be the Disney studios? Do you think, you know, IMAX I, is going to be a thing? Like how it's going to I mean, happen? I think it was changing before January, 2020. I mean, I, I noticed my, like, I, I'm a big fan of the movie theater subscription model. Mm-hmm. Personally, because I just I was like for twenty bucks I can go to the movie theaters every weekend. Count me in, and maybe I'll buy an extra popcorn and the you know get the movies. We'll we'll make a little more money off of me. So I was already way on board with the subscription model, and then my AMC just recently switched over to all the you know the big the big chairs and the yeah. more spaced out stuff. And mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, this is what I I would I'll pay extra to do this. So I mean, we're no longer. It's not that 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 you know sardines in a can kind of situation oh. where they used to squeeze everybody in the theater and the seats were like worse than you know airline seats or they were the same as airline seats but so i so i think that in that respect um but then again it's it, there's a there's an old there's a theater that does the second hand uh well, not second second run theater yeah second, whatever that like a dollar theater yeah dollar theater and they used to always do they do like rocky horror every every three or four months right. and there's that there's a little bit of that that i'm like i i, I don't want to see that go away you know i want i want to be throwing popcorn at the screen and having just a you know, crazy time on the, in the theater so you know maybe but maybe the dollar theater model still kind of floats around as a side you know, that doesn't mean you, you, you could have more than one you know model out there so yeah it, it was changing i think um so and I think with uh, with the recent the COVID discussion about how we have to separate the seats and all that, it's going to be quite different, at least for 
at least for the rest of this year. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. No. Oh, for I think I think for the foreseeable future, it's good. The foreseeable future, yeah. I think the next two or three years, this is going to be uh, not exactly what we're going through right now, but mm-hmm. there'll be different versions of this moving forward. I, don't, I think COVID, I don't think is going to go away. Um, in the no, way it, it, it's going to be with us in one way, shape, or form. Um, we're not eradicating it anytime in the near yeah, future. Exactly. So and. The, and the- and there's always the other uh, the question of what's next after COVID. You know, what, what uh, <laughs> disease comes next that we all get? Well, there's freaked. there's murder hornets, um, <laughs> earthquakes, um, explosions. I mean, there's just so, there's a I'm sure there's a meteor on its way as we speak. <laughs> so everyone busts out a deep impact and Armageddon so we can figure out how we deal with it. Yeah, but there's it's coming. It's- it's coming. The secret, the secret is oil, oil, oil drillers. That's how we get through the next. <laughs> no, let's not train astronauts to drill. Let's train no. drillers to be astronauts in five days. Yes, this <laughs> this makes all the sense in the world. But hell, what a hell of a romp of a film! I love Armageddon. Oh, yeah. it's, it's, My a, goodness. it's a guilty that's, pleasure. <laughs> that's going back a ways. <laughs> I mean, look, I look. I'll watch Armageddon before I'll watch Deep Impact. Like I, I watched Deep Impact yeah. once. I've seen Armageddon probably. 10 times in my life so (laughs) you know uh what's the uh what was it the every frame of painting did the whole thing on mayhem oh yeah that's a a really good good uh video just discussion about him he gets so little respect for for being kind of just visually interesting though even though his even though his storylines might be stupid but you got to give it to him man he knows how to frame a shot i said this i've said this publicly before and i'll say it again there's action films before michael bay and there's action films yeah. after michael bay and the same thing happened with ridley scott when ridley no ridley uh, tony scott when tony scott mm-hmm. showed up there's action films before tony there's action shots uh, uh, films after tony they shift the visual medium michael bay everybody wanted to look at their action films to look like michael bay they just did, and you yeah. could see them. They just they copied oh, yeah. the shots, and they never got it right. And you know, there's there's guys out there who remain nameless directors who really, really like were on top of trying to exactly do what Michael Bay did, and all this kind of stuff. Regardless, you love him or hate him, like The Rock is still probably my favorite Michael Bay film of all time, um, and it still holds up. It's probably the best story. Um, but love him or hate him, you've got to respect the visual prowess of what he's been oh, able yeah. to do. I mean, it's. There is nobody in the history of film that did what he's done. You know, do I like all his films? N- no. Um, but visually, I mean, what was he the changed last, the game. last one he did for Netflix? Um, was, oh, yeah. The one with, um, with uh, Ryan, Ryan Reynolds. Reynolds. Yeah, that wasn't bad. But, but you could I, tell. I, it's, you could tell it's, it's Michael. Like the second a frame yeah, shows up. Oh, yeah. That's it. I mean, there's a lot of stupid stuff that you're looking at. And like, like, whoa, I never thought you would do that in a frame. It's like, there's so much clever visual stuff that's going on. It's, yeah, sure, it's wrapped in some, some kind of silliness from, in my taste. But like, I can appreciate the fact that the, there's, there's, there's just sit, set pieces that are like, this is very creative. This is very ingenious. So yeah, I, I, I end up really liking that, that movie. Yeah, I'm probably, I can't remember the name of it. But. Oh, it was like six something six or something six, like that. Yes, yeah, something like that. Something, something six. Like yeah, it was like the six ghost yeah. ghost guys out there doing what they do. Um, but um, going go real back to theaters real quick. I mean, I've always mm-hmm. said that theaters have had a combative relationship with their customer base um, for a <laughs> long. I mean, it, it, it's first of all, the experience used to suck. Um, so yeah. it was this? It was sardines, sticky floors stale popcorn and then they charge you inside $45 for a coke um $75 mm-hmm. for a for a popcorn like yeah. it's like it's almost like um <laughs> it's almost like uh, airport <laughs> food yeah. costs so and they never really cared a lot but then slowly but surely as their numbers started to go down they're like oh wait a minute we've got to create a better experience because we're not the only show in town anymore and that's when these Seats mm-hmm. started showing up and and bars like in like the AMC here in Burbank has like a bar inside of it and it's like you know special seatings and the sound got better, but it's like you know for a certain generation we all remember like and they're still abusive. I still think they're abusive totally, in their pricing. Totally, they're, they're so abusive well, in their pricing. For a beer, come on, give me a break. Yeah, so no, there's still. 
Go ahead. Well, I was going to say that the other day I was thinking about this and I forgot to mention it. But yeah, if you if the if this Disney owned, I mean, Disney's not going to Disney's not going to lower the price. I think. <laughs> oh no! Kind of get- but their experience. Look, when you walk into Disneyland or Disney World. Oh yeah. You just I, my wife and I every time we drive into the parking lot to one of those places we just go let the beating begin. <laughs> because you are you're just being charged like $25 for parking and you're boom boom, boom yeah. like and you're just and you're in there but the experience they are offering you a very high quality experience for the most part. So that's what you get but you don't get that with a standard movie theater. Like right. a, well, have you ever been to the El Capitan? No, I haven't. I need to go. So when I went to the, when I went to El Capitan, I saw Frozen there with my daughters, uh-huh. and uh, they had like the, the princess came out and did like a pre-show, and yeah. and there's this stuff. It was like you know it's Disney everything, and next door there's a Disney store, and it's like this whole experience. And the price honestly wasn't much different than a normal movie theater. So I was like, okay, this is this makes sense. This makes sense. Well, I think I think my, the point I uh, was trying to make was that I think if if let's say let's not pick Disney, let's say like Amazon or something owns a studio or owns mm-hmm. a theater, you might conceivably see a, a lowering of the costs of like concessions oh. because traditionally the, the argument was that concessions is where the movie theater makes money. Well, if the movie theater is owned by the studio, then the, they're also making money on the on the, on the uh, ticket price. Right. So conceivably, they can lower the you know popcorn being seven dollars for a small. Maybe it's five dollars for a small. Mm-hmm. And, that, and that's still abusive. Time. And that's still abusive. But sure. But it's, it's three is two, three dollars less. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Agreed. So um, that might be that might be a benefit that comes out of it. I don't know. We'll it's a different business model. I mean, since you're a business yeah. major. So if you look at a business models of, of, th- of theaters, it's they get, you know, 50 percent or you know, forty uh, percent or thirty percent, depending on the big how big the movie is and the week it's mm-hmm. coming out. So you get a small percentage of, the, of of the box office. All their money is made at concessions. But if the studio owns the the space, then they get a hundred percent of royal of the sales at the box mm-hmm. office, and they get a little bit off of royalties off of the um, concessions. But where they start making their money is off of ancillary products. And right. so if there's a Warner Brothers style um, theater chain, then There'd be all sorts of Warner Brothers, and you could buy the poster of the movie. You yeah. could buy all the merch for that movie that week, and it's it's rotating in and out every week. And it, it makes sense. That's a different business model than what we have currently, and it's going to change. There's just no. I mean, ArcLight. You've been to ArcLights, I'm assuming. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they have that little store on the side that has like you know the movie memorabilia stuff, and sometimes they would bring out stuff, but it's kind of like almost not a throwaway, but it's not themed out like a Warner Brothers or a Disney uh, or even an Amazon um, Mm -hmm. theater would have because – and with Amazon's um, data on people's buying habits, they know what products are going to be out there. And they're going to have you just walk in with your app, pick up the thing and walk out and they charge your Amazon account. I mean that's (laughs) – Oh, boy. That would be – well, they have those stores. That, convenient. They have those stores now. They have the bookstore now, like that, the Amazon bookstore that you walk not, in. Not, not to get sidetracked too much, but I'll just tell you a story about yesterday. I was yeah. returning something from Amazon, and I found out that Amazon has this Kohl's thing where you go into Kohl's and you just drop yeah. off your product. And I did that, and then the the Kohl's said, "Thanks for dropping off. Here's a twenty five percent coupon for Kohl's." And I was so impressed by it that I actually bought something. <laughs> I was like, "I need some sandals," and I just bought them and. I was like, this is br- this is such a brilliant idea because it's a great service for me because I don't have to package it, I don't have to take it to UPS, I don't have to worry about that. And uh, gets me in their store, and I got I got what I wanted. I needed some sandals, so I I finally got have, my sandals, and I got a coupon for it. So for Coles, so it's win. yeah, for Coles, it's a little bit you know a little bit we more hassle. One person staff, yeah. one person staff to deal with it, and more foot traffic. And Amazon's like, I we need more, we need real estate. So yeah. we'll, we'll give you traffic. You give us the real estate. Well, it's a deal. It, it, it is. It's, it, it is fairly, fairly brilliant. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about production, film production. Okay. Um, yeah. What do you think it's going to look like? I mean, you're shooting now. Like, how how is it working? You know, shooting with, you know, with this COVID stuff. I mean, yeah. for one man crew or, or short, like two man crew is one thing. But like for narrative? TV show, like I, I don't know how you move forward right right now, I, at least. 
I real I agree with you. I I mean I I do one man two man things operations. I do and you know, I work with corporate clients of including school districts and what it just it's a lot. I mean I don't get uh, I, I don't want to sound too uh, too dangerously political I guess, but it, it's it's a lot about optics. It's about appearing to look like you're doing. I mean you, have to, you wear the mask, you stay your do your social distancing, you you apply uh you know you apply the 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 hand sanitizers and all that. But it it really just comes down to, we just have to look like we're doing our jobs. And unfortunately, um, with, 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 when you get to larger narratives, when you have lots of groups of people, you know, hair, makeup and, and sets and all that, mm. and just 30, 40 people cruise. I don't, it's hard to maintain those optics. I mean, you can, there's, there's a whole movement about, you know, getting so many people trained in, you know, uh, health and safety and having yeah. that one person on set. And, Look, is that really going to make that much a difference or is that you're just kind of – it's just a CYA maneuver? Um, oh, I don't know. I, you know, I, I don't I, – I don't I don't see us really getting into like traditional – and this is I guess what's – look, I, I don't know if you've uh, – you've probably been affected. But I think I feel like a lot – the society in general has been kind of had like overhanging depression <laughs> because oh. of all of this. Yeah. You know? It was like, so, um, I, like, Obama, like Michelle Obama came out and she said she has low-grade depression. And uh, I think it was everyone does. And and I think what Seth Meyers said is like when you go low, I go high. I have high grade depression, <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's very it's very true. No, there is. A, there, I mean, I don't know why I do this, but I watch the news every day. Um, and I just watch thirty minutes of Sorry. it. it. Just I, I know yeah. it's. I watch network news, and I just watch it just to just to find out what's going on. Yeah. Just just to stay informed because. We got kind of got kind of got to know what's going on. I mean, because yeah. I never was a, a person who watched the news. Like I just, I'm like, you know what? If it's big enough, I'll hear about it. I'll find it on mm-hmm. my Facebook feed, or someone will tell me about it. Um, and now it's just like things are changing so rapidly, and craziness is happening on a daily basis that you kind of have to stay for. And you know, I, I sit there with I with my wife, and I just turned to her, I'm like, why, 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 why are we doing this? I don't under. You know, we're hope we're praying for that last segment, which is like how a puppy saved someone with COVID. <laughs> like it's, it's, it's yeah. like that's we're praying for that one happy moment <laughs> at the end of the, of the broadcast. Yeah, that's what, well, that's what, that's what the sort of pressing is. I think you know, I'm trying to if I try to put together like a small production, and I'm and I'm not I'm not throwing lots of money at it. I'm just gonna you know put together a little short film or something. I can't really foreseeably do that in the next, you know, few months. Oh, um, no. Just because, if I wanted to cast it, it, it would be difficult because there's going to be half of your cast is probably saying, "Well, I'm not going to, or not even interested in, in working in, in something right now. They don't want to be in anything, you know." And I'm not going to be paying them like, huge amounts of money. This is more of like a for fun project. How can you? It's hard to justify, it and it's hard to even even look like you, you're doing. I don't know. You're watching. I'm watching old movies and thinking like. Huh, I wish we could hug people like that <laughs> in the movie because you can't do any of that stuff. Yeah, so I don't know what's going to happen. Love scenes. How can you do a love scene? <laughs> no. How can you do a fight? Like a, like a, no. like a, like a, a fight fight? Like a close combat fight? No, you can't do it. I mean, it, it, it's, I know, I mean, someone like Tyler Perry who has an infrastructure that makes all the yeah. sense in the world, he's popping out content like crazy. And he was, he's a guy who creates content. Like he creates like uh, like fifty his, episodes of a show in like four weeks or something like that. His like workflow is amazing. I mean, I'm in the he just guy. pumps it out. But he has a yeah. he is a unique person because he has an entire movie studio at his disposal, <laughs> which he can exactly. quarantine, lock it down, and everyone's in a bubble for that time. And you can shoot. That makes sense. Um, mm-hmm. But no, we're not set up for that. Like that's never no. been a thing, and that's in the studio world, let alone in the indie world. I actually did a whole episode about covid safety because i went for a bike ride and i saw of course independent filmmakers on the side of the road in my neighborhood shooting a short or some scenes um that were covid related because the guys were dressed up in like you know hazmat suits and stuff okay and i'm just and they nobody was when they had the hazmat suit off but the head was off they were all clunked together in a small group talking the actors were all talking and then the director and dp were setting something up over there and that nobody had masks on and i'm like this this is so irresponsible like you can't Mm -hmm. you can't do that like i couldn't as a film director put my cast or crew in harm's way right now with for a film like Mm -hmm. 
it's not worth it right now. It, it, it just doesn't make any sense to do something like that. I, I, I can't in good, in good conscience. I'll send it further too. I mean, look, I, I may not, if, if someone, and I'm not saying my, I, I disagree, but I'm saying if you, even if you think it's not an issue, you can't get other people to do it. You know, what I mean, it's it's like so you're you're just unless you find like a bunch of people that all agree that, oh, we're going to take the risk. But that's not fun. That's not the point of making films. Um, you, you know, you right. Want to have the opinion. So it's I, I don't I. Yeah, we're all independent film. All, independent film is going to have a rough time for the next few years and, and people are going to have much. to get very creative. You know, they're going to if they are going to do something, it's going to be. You know, kind of like what I did with my last film, which was well, last last film I couldn't do now is because going to Sundance and shooting at Sundance, um, which is something I can't do right now. But it was a small crew; yeah. it was a three three man crew. It was me, the uh-huh. DP, and the sound guy, and then my uh-huh. actors, and that was it. And I was running around, so you you, you have to you have to start getting creative um, in, in in the storytelling process on how to do it. Like I've been hearing from the studios, people in the studios, that they're saying when you're writing, no crowds. Don't put this in. Don't put that in anymore. No more love scenes. It, it, you know, like do, figure out another way to do it. If we, if we're going to continue to move, so I think there's going to be a COVID era in filmmaking, yeah. where after we're done with everything that's in the can, <laughs> we're going to start seeing films and television shows that are going to be just like, oh, that was in the COVID era, and yeah. and it's going to be like they can't kiss, they can't touch. It's like this whole weird yeah. thing. Um, but I think that's what's going to happen. And independent film, I think, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm so, waiting for the next great COVID era independent film, like the El Mariachi of this era. I don't know what that will be, <laughs> you know, that's going to like take the world by storm, like the the paranormal, like paranormal activity, perfect COVID movie, like perfect COVID movie. Well, like you can shoot in per- bed together, though. That's a problem. <laughs> no, no, no. But if they're, if they've quarantined together, they're fine. You know, okay, they're fine. They, okay, gotcha. So again, but this is a small crew, very mm-hmm. small amount. You know, if you quarantine with somebody for two weeks and everyone's all we're all good, all right, great, let's let's go. And we're all in a house and it's very controlled. And mm-hmm. that's the kind of films I think we're gonna be seeing coming out. Yeah. I I mean I always think about like what what will future generations look back and, and ask us, you know, like, oh, you lived through that era. What was it like? It's <laughs> it's gonna be an interesting story to tell the grandkids. So, no. So I want to go back real quick to Filmmaker IQ, man, yeah. because I, I just right. I love what you do with Filmmaker IQ. You've you've created some amazing okay. I've promoted your stuff over the years as far as those little mini documentaries you make over like, you know, a lens, the depth of field, yeah. uh, the the 180 rule, like and then all, you know, all this color and like, 28 frames and 24 frames a second and all this kind of stuff. How why do you do it? Cause it's a lot of work, dude. It's a, it's like, a I can, s- it's a ton. You've got the little 3D image, the, the 3D guys coming yeah. out, setting all the, I mean, to create a 15 minute video must take you forever. Well, the last video I did was started at the beginning of the COVID thing was that Fox video, mm-hmm. uh, the William, history of William Fox it ended up being like 43 minutes long. And it was a ton of research just trying to go. Well, I mean, why do I, why, why did, I mean, I think it's also, it's, it's a, uh, it's a self-expression kind of a thing. I, I really enjoy um, – I just really enjoy exploring the truth of a topic like that and kind of going in depth into it because I don't – I feel like no one else is really kind of tackling it the way that, that I do, which is just yeah. un, unrelenting <laughs> depth. <laughs> oh, just, just obscene, like, obscene obsessive. depth. 15 yeah, minutes on, on on focus like or on depth of field oh, i think yeah. like 15 minutes of that like it was like but it's so entertaining and like you go into which, the history of it and it's like the lenses and the breakdowns oh, it's great <laughs> and of which i will get like plenty of youtube comments that will argue with me and tell me i'm completely wrong because <laughs> i have not done the research obviously uh, you know, yeah but uh now I, you know it's also born i, I think I've, i have a i have an internet forum personality where i do like to go on on i i unfortunately read all the comments and i engage and don't do that and, don't do that yeah <laughs> i mean it's it's a habit I mean, it's part of who who i am it, 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 a lot of stuff drives sometimes the ideas for new content was based on oh that person made a mistake about that so i want to talk about that particular point you know but uh part it's 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 kind of in that in that range that's that's you know i i want to get to the point where i don't where i can no longer read comments because there's too many of them that's 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 my goal <laughs> but until then i'm just i'm stuck arguing about 24 frames a second every day yeah i mean 
I mean, and the, and the depth that you do in these videos is pretty insane. And the research that goes into them is, is insane. The production of them. And again, you've been doing this for years now, over a decade. Yeah. You know, you've been, you've been doing, cause some of these, well, the, the, some of those little documentaries, the ones with the little, the little dude, I call them the little dudes. I don't know if you have it specific. Dudes, yeah. The, 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 the little 3D dudes, they go back seven, eight years. Yeah, in about eight years. That's when we started doing the videos because we were when we first started Filmmaker IQ, it was more of an aggregator site, a blog site, mm-hmm. and we we would do like what all the other bloggers do is just go out and try to find articles and post them together. Mm-hmm. Um, and just the funny thing is, you, if you do that long enough, you kind of get a very good sense of what the blogosphere looks like, and you get kind of disgusted by it. Like, ah, uh, I've seen the same thing over again. So we decided at that point, like, ah, we should start making our own stuff instead of relying on other people to make stuff. So that's when the videos started happening. And the first one was like Dolly Zoom when I first <laughs> explored that topic. But yeah, uh, but I think I think what it is is um, I, I, I've talked to some people about this, but I feel like filmmakers have like a like, a, like 80% of filmmakers have an expiration date of like, say, I want to say like three or four years. It's like I think three mm-hmm. or four years it takes to learn everything about filmmaking. And it's still that fun. Like exciting. Oh, I get to learn about this camera. This new camera is coming out. So about three or four years, you absorb all this information. And then after that, you either, if you love it, you continue on and you, and you pursue like story and you pursue creation of actual, and you you just said a product, you know, you you get over the, the, uh, oh, this is exciting. We're just learning thing. And then the other segment of the population just loses interest and they, they disappear. So I feel like a lot of what the growth in, in the internet is, capturing that first like three or four years of people that are just starting to learn this stuff. And, uh, what's scary about that is there's so much marketing. There's so much like mm. you know, the, the manufacturers are shoving down marketing information down your throat. Like, like, uh, like I'm just, I'm going to pick on them. Black magic just came. I do. You were going to say, I do. You were going to yeah, say black you know, magic. Like, <laughs> 12 K camera. And they're saying it's revolutionary. It doesn't have a Bayer system. And I'm sitting back here thinking, the Bayer system is a good thing. People, there's people online saying the Bayer system sucks now because mm-hmm. this new marketing is coming down and slapping them with this new – we got this new system of camera. Um, I, so I don't know where I'm going with all of this. I'll well, I mean – but it started with Red. Red was the one that first came yes. out with 4K and just like exploded. I remember at NAB yes. when it was a box. It was a box. And they're like, just give us ten thousand dollars, and you will get a camera one day. And like that was insane. And he, they yeah. sold like whatever five hundred cameras that during NAB at that time, and they changed the game. Red changed the game. Love them or hate them, they changed the game. Mm-hmm. Aerie took a while to catch up, and now people argue all the time. Aerie's better than Red. Sony's better than Aerie. And and Black Magic is now you know Black Magic was like kind of the redheaded stepchild for a long time, and now they've kind of come into their own as a a real player in the camera game you know and i've always said personal i'm a big i love black magic i've i've had I've, I've, I've shot black magic i shot both my features on them um and i i love black magic cameras and davinci i edit and resolve and you know i drank the Kool-Aid because i feel because i feel that they have the best bang for the buck mm-hmm. i think out of all the cinematic cameras i think they have the best bang for the buck and i i did some tests once and i shot an airy down the middle an area Alexa down the middle, and I shot the 4.6K Black Magic down the middle. And I put them up and I and I brought in some filmmakers and some DPs. I'm like, which is which? And mm-hmm. nine out of ten times they couldn't they could not tell the difference because the Black Magic image it lit the same, everything was the same, same lenses, same everything. The image is equivalent. It's not you can, and I know a lot of people are gonna be like, no, what are you saying? I'm like, no, listen, calm the hell down. Where the the cost, the reason why the, the the Alexa costs so much more, is when you start going three or four stops under, five stops, yeah. under, it, it falls apart. The black magic falls apart. But if you shoot it like you're supposed to shoot it, it's pretty damn good. And the cost versus like yeah. eighty eighty thousand versus this, a really easy workflow versus a fairly intense workflow in post. All of all of that, you just gotta kind of look. And now the twelve k, what is it? how much does it cost? Ten thousand? Ten thousand dollars? Yeah. I, I you know I'm, I'm not gonna it's, get it. I'm fine with my. I have a four point six. I'm good. <laughs> it's yeah, like it's an interesting camera. The thing is, I've seen a lot of people jump on board with it, and it's just I don't feel like 
the, the existence of a 12K camera does not invalidate your 4.6K camera. Right. You know, but it feels like a lot of people are are thinking that. And, and, and That's marketing. I mean, it's not. And look, Grant Petty's, I, I, he's, he did a good job on his video, but I think it's the, it's the next layer. It's the people that talk about what he said that are kind of overhyping it. And, uh, that's, that's what, that's what bugs me about kind of marketing. And that's kind of what I've tried to do with my videos a little bit is trying to get down to the fundamentals, get down to the understanding of how, what does, what does it mean when they say Bayer system or what Bayer pattern? You know, uh, what does that mean? And then kind of cut through some of that marketing hype that you're just constantly inundated with. And uh, that's so that's going back. That's kind of what I'm trying to do with some of these videos. So like, yeah, uh, when Black when Black Magic came out with the 4K, uh, the little mini pocket 4K, then that everybody was like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, it's a pocket 4K. And then like five months later, four months later, the 6K comes out, and I'm like, are you kidding me, guys? Are you are you effing kidding me? Really? Yeah. Like, can you can you stop it? Can you, can you just not do, and I know the black magic guys, I've worked with black magic. I yell at them all the time. I'll go like, dude, dude, seriously, man, like just give us a year, give us like some time to like enjoy what we have. Like, I'll give you a better one. I have the uh, Adam mini, which I bought uh, like <laughs> early, well, I think early this year, they came with an Adam mini pro, which I bought because I like, cause I need that multicam view, which is what it added to the system. And then a month later, or like a, the week I got it after being on back order for a month, they announced the Atom Mini Pro ISO, which can record all all your camera streams at the same time. So it's like literally like a month after I got this thing, a brand new one came out. And I'm looking at it like, ah, I, that's a great feature to have. Do I need it? Not really. But man, I wish I had that option. That's the thing is that you have to get used to the fact that, hey, you know what? I can I need to stop buying technology and make stuff with the ha- stuff I have uh, had purchased. Amen. That's that's what I need to do. Well, I think, but, and I think a lot of filmmakers use technology as an excuse not to actually get into the arena. Um, oh, well, yeah, that's so true. I, I mean, so many filmmakers just like, oh, I can't shoot it because I need this camera, um, or I can't shoot it because I need that camera. What I what I argue when people argue with me about twenty four frames a second, and people say that they want a high frame rate uh, movies, uh, I, I always say, go out there and shoot them yourself. Like you, you be the change. You, you, you go out and then every single time they always tell me I can't because I don't have any of this. I don't have any equipment. I don't have any cast. Or, so it's always, it's always an excuse to, to, uh, well, to get out of making something. Well, listen, man. Uh, I, I mean, I've, I've been, in, I've been a filmmaker for 20 odd, 25 years plus, and I understand the excuse demon, um, yeah. because it's fear. We're fearful mm-hmm. of putting ourselves out there. We're fearful of creating art and, oh, my God, no one's going to like it. The comments, holy cow, yeah. um, all of that kind of stuff. And and not to mention the, the pressure of if it's, you know, the cost and people you're working with and can I really do it and all of the – there's so many doubts and fears that we as filmmakers have that we find whatever excuse. Look, same thing happens with screenwriters. That's like, oh, I'll, I'll write tomorrow. Um, or it's yeah. it, like there's fear as an artist in general. There's always fear. And gear is the one of the easiest things you can say like, oh, I don't have this camera. I don't have that camera. Uh, or I don't have this lighting. Oh, I need that location. Or I can't make this script without three million. Like I can't. Yeah. Just, I just – I can't. Not to say I'm not going to go write a script that can make for 10000 but at this script, I can't make. So I'm going to just sit around for three years chasing money for it. And I, that makes me feel like I'm a filmmaker, but you're really not a filmmaker. You're yeah. just a guy or a gal chasing money that will more than likely never happen. And I, I played that game for 20 years, yeah. 20 years. I played that game. So I turned 40 and I was attached to another big project with a big producer and screenwriter and the, the project fell apart again. And I said, I'm 40. I can't do this anymore. So 30 days later, I was shooting my first feature with a uh-huh. Black Magic Cinema 2.5K. Why? Because I had it. Did you have? Yeah. And and I didn't even hire a DP. I lit the damn thing myself, and I had never really DP'd before. I was a colorist for 10 years, yeah. so I felt that I could get it. I just get me it down the middle. I'll fix it in post, and I did. You're, ins- you're inspiring me, Alex. Man, I need to get on my button <laughs> something. But I did. But I that's love that story. It. But the thing is that I didn't. I, I made it because I, I was already in with Indie Film Hustle at that time. So 
I felt very comfortable I, for whatever. It was something psychological, but I just felt, oh, I have indie film house I can go back to. Like I have my, mm-hmm. I have my tribe. So if it doesn't work out, eh, no big deal. Because I don't know about you, but in my mind, when I made my first feature, it was going to be Reservoir Dogs. I mean, I don't know about you, but it was going to be Reservoir Dogs. It was going to be Mariachi. It was going to be Clerks. It was going to be one of these big independent sure. films that explode out of the gate. So that pressure that I put on myself stifled me for 20 years. And of course, I was fearful. And of course, I was chasing every other dream and every other little project and everything else because I was scared to actually go do it. Whereas when I finally just said, you know what, screw it, I'm going to just go out and shoot it. 30 days later, we shot with a scriptment, which was a you know eight page outline with a bunch of stand up comics and improvisers, and we shot around our uh, we shot at all their apartments and around L.A. and we shot the whole damn thing in eight days. Um, I went up to the Hollywood sign and, sh- and stole it. Um, <laughs> which, by the way, anyone wanting to shoot on the Hollywood sign, this is this is a little tip if you just want to because if you want to get yeah. permits and stuff, it becomes a pain in the ass. But, <laughs> uh, yeah. So I was like, I'm just going to steal it. And like halfway, and we were really, I was scared. I'm like, oh my God, what do we get? This is the Hollywood sign. Oh my God. Halfway yeah. up while I'm lugging the gear up with my actress, my actress is walking in front of me and I'm, I've got all this gear that I'm, I'm lugging up. And I said, no one's coming. No <laughs> one cares. No one cares. No one cares. Like if someone called them, Hey, someone's illegally shooting by the, they're not helicoptering somebody in. <laughs> By the time they get up there, I'm done with my shot. So yeah. I just realized I'm like, oh, okay, fine. I don't. I could just shoot. And we shot, and it was all these cool I- images and stuff that we got up there. But I didn't give my mind a a, a moment to stop itself because yeah. it was afraid. And I just did it, and I was done. And I got it out there, and and it it sold to Hulu, and we sold internationally, and we did very well with it. And it was cost, cost like five grand to make, and it was great. But that was. I had to, it took me 20 years to get there because of yeah. the fear. And I think gear was one of the, oh man, I, I need a red. I can't. I need, oh, a, yeah. I need a red. I need I a red. I can't. I need, I need a gimbal. I need to have all this stuff. Oh, I need, I need, I need a techno. How can I not shoot without I, a techno? Oh, no, I mean, not. have you ever shot, have you ever shot with a techno, by the way? No, I've seen them, but I never touched. On, I was shooting a music video and I had a techno the entire day. First time I ever had one. Oh my God, it's so amazing. <laughs> Yeah, that. It's, it's just it lived on the tech all day. Just at the, I just like I can't I can't I can't shoot without a, a mini techno everywhere I go. It was so <laughs> amazing to have that thing. I was just like, oh, I get why James Cameron has like twenty of these on the set just in case. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but anyway, so that's the that's the fear thing. So uh, I, I think, think gear is that. Expand, we've, we've kind of talking about gear fear, fear of gear, but I think it's also. The, the fear of actually materializing your idea. Cause as long as it's an idea in your head, it's brilliant. It's perfect. You know, the movie oh, in your yeah. head is, is, a, is Oscar winning. You put it on paper and then you start realizing, Oh crap, it's maybe it's mm. not that good. And then There's you start shooting. Ooh, ooh, maybe. Yeah. Or you see it. Oh, oh crap. This isn't really as good as I thought it was going to be. It's a fear. No, it, it, it is. It, it's scary, man. It's scary being a filmmaker and doing all that. But you know, anyone listening out there, I hope they don't get caught up that because tomorrow you'll wake up and you'll be, you know, seventy, and you'll be yeah. still chasing that 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 Hollywood dream that Hollywood sells you that is bogus. It's the sizzle. There's yeah. no stake behind it, and you kind of just got to go out and do it. Like my second film, I shot with the pocket camera, 1080p, the mm-hmm. first generation pocket camera. I shot the whole movie yeah. on that. People thought where well, I was crazy. That was crazy to shoot a whole film on that. I'm like, no, I love the look of it. It looks great. Uh-huh. And it was a 1080p camera, right? Blew it up to 2K for a, for my DCP, screened it at the Chinese theater. I, it's one of the best things I've ever shot in my life. It was, was beautiful, oh, cool. these shots. I was like, I can't, I was, I was scared to death because on my, my, my 55 inch, you know, a color grading monitor, it looked great. I'm like, yeah, but this yeah. is you know, projection. And like, I don't know. And, and the first time I saw it was at the Chinese theater projected theatrically. I was like, holy cow, it holds. Like I thought it was going to get pigs. Like it held oh. so beautifully. So I don't want to hear excuses from people like, oh, this and that. And if you want to go to Tangerine with the iPhone and right. it, it, just worry about your story, people will mm-hmm. forgive the image quality and don't get caught up in like, you're, dude, you're not deacons. Like you're yes. not deacons. Anyone listening, you're not Roger Deakins. You're not going to make something look like Roger Deakins. I'm sorry. It's 
because there's one Roger Deakins. You're not going right. to be Fincher. You're not going to be Nolan. You're not going to be Spielberg because they're that's what they do. And it took them years, if not decades, to get to where they are. Be yourself and be the best version of yourself that you can be. And that's all we could ever do as a filmmaker. That's a fantastic message. No, no Deakins doesn't work alone. He's got you know script. Uh, set dressers he's got you know location scouts and all the basically all the all the resources at his disposal ex, expose uh, exposal yeah but I was, I was gonna say that and this might sound a little narcissistic but if if some if it was between me and steven spielberg and steel spielberg was given like 15 minutes to work a scene and shoot it and i was given eight hours to, to shoot the scene and i had the same people that steven spielberg has I think I would probably hold up. At least I would. I wouldn't. I wouldn't embarrass myself. I think you get something uh, competent up there. It, 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 yeah, it, it'd be something there. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I mean, I know what you're saying. You're not saying that you're Steven Spielberg, nor that right. you can compete at that level because he's Steven Spielberg. No one can. Exactly. But if you use the same crew, the same resources, chances are your stuff is going to look. It would be more presentable John Hess than it would be Steven Spielberg, but it would still be okay. I mean, it, it, it's especially given a time a time difference. That I had if I had a lot more time than Steven Spielberg, eh, I might pull off something. You yeah, know? It's something that looks really good, like you know, yeah. something that looks really good. Um, and then uh, before before we go, man, I gotta ask you, cats. Oh, okay, cats. I mean, <laughs> come on, let's let's yeah, let's talk about cats for a second because I, you, you wrote a, you yeah. you did a video about that you like cats. And um, I've spoken about cats publicly many times. Okay. And I generally don't like to bash other filmmakers uh, on the on the show. And I'm not bashing the filmmaker. That something happened, in my opinion. I don't know what it was because it was such a perfect storm that you <laughs> will never see in your lifetime again because you had yeah. Spielberg producing, you had an Oscar winner directing it, you had based on one of the biggest Broadway shows of all time with the biggest music stars of all time some oscar like oscar, they were throwing oscar winners around like it was water on that set mm -hmm. and to and everyone drank the kool-aid like everyone said this is going to be huge this is a great idea that doesn't happen you know you get the room every once in a while like you'll get the yeah. room you'll get a show girls you'll get a trolls too you'll get something that's <laughs> so bad that it transcends being good I'm still not at the point where Cats transcends to being good. I got through yeah. 20 minutes of it and I just said, oh my God, this is so bad. I can't keep going. Maybe with a group of people, I could watch it again, but I can't. The room, I could watch again and again, but I can't watch Cats. <laughs> well, I think with Cats, I think what's for me, to me is I enjoyed, I really liked basically the garishness of it is part of it. <laughs> the first 20 minutes is when you had, when you had the Jenny Any Dot sequence, when you had the kids and the cockroaches. Oh, that's, that is a bridge too far. That I mean, that's <laughs> you think? The worst. That's the worst part of the movie. I, I, I guarantee. Oh, it gets better. It gets you. better. It gets better. Oh, okay. totally. It, it is. It is totally so like once you get past that. You mean once you get tough. past the dancing cockroaches? Um, but with the children you, faces. That's with children's part. faces. But that's the thing. I, I, I want. I just want to impress upon everyone listening is that this was a universal movie with Spielberg yeah. producing it, like with. A hundred million dollars behind it. This doesn't happen. These studios don't take risks like this. Not but like on that. but on paper, this was a sure hit fire hit. Like mm -hmm. this was a hit on paper. It had it checked every single box off. The one thing it did not check off was uh the cat anuses um that were <laughs> in it and the unfinished hands and visual effects that oh, they yeah. released it with. It was oh god. I didn't even notice the hands part, but I think what I what I appreciate with with cats though is it it does offer it adds something to the the musical genre that has been missing in a long for a long time, and that's actually having some people involved that are and again I'm looking past the effects, which I think I just kind of got it's like a hot tub you kind of get used to it after a while. <laughs> for me at least. That was great. It's a great uh, analogy. Like after a while, it's really hot when you get in, but after a while, just yeah. like it just waves over it's okay. you. It's, it's, it's fine. It's like the ocean. <laughs> but yeah, I think. But I think you got like all these. A lot of the role, a lot of the the more major roles of cat. And again, like I got, I got admit, this is an admission that I am a big cats fan before okay. the movie came out. So I okay. know I knew the 
there's not a story. It's it's a collection of songs. It's really what it is. It's it's based on poems by T. S. Eliot. Right. So I, I I mean I have that background of it. So I under I knew the characterizations, but I, you have a lot of people that are that are in the musical genre that don't because the musical genre is for a long time has been plagued by the fact that you have to have the paper. The paper has to say you know we have this star and it's going to bring this much box off this star this star, and the problem with you know that is uh, Johnny Depp for example in Sweeney Todd. He's not really a good singer, not for that particular role. Um, that's the pro. The, so what Cats did, which was kind of re- unique, was that they got a lot of people in the leads that aren't household names that are that are from like the Royal Ballet Company, mm-hmm. um, which was like, wow, we're actually bringing in people that are good artists. Now we <laughs> we covered them with I, fake fur, I, <laughs> but. but and those sets. At least they brought just, in some good, some good art. The, if you actually, if you were to only watch one segment and not, and just kind of ignore the rest of, if you watch the Skimble Shanks, the Railway Cat, and this is this is this sound absurd now. <laughs> if you watch just that segment, and you can, <laughs> it's it not too has, bad. <laughs> it's actually very good because it's probably the best segment in the entire film. It's not, it's not like disturbing. There's no children on cockroaches. Um, but it's actually, you actually see some very, very high level dancing on, on, on display. Oh. It's something you don't actually see in any, in, in movies. So I'll give, I'll give the filmmaker credit for that. It's look, um, it's lit beautifully. The dancing's yeah. great. The singing is fantastic. Um, the songs are the songs. They're great. You know, um, what a genital little cat, whatever the hell that thing is called. Angelical I don't know. Cat. Angelical cat. Uh, the tonight, the yeah. first eight minutes of the movie is just one long ass song. And my wife looked at me and she's like, yeah. is this going to stop anytime <laughs> soon? I'm like, no, it's not. It's not. And uh, the best review I've ever heard for a movie was for cats. And it's one sentence, which is so perfect. Cats is the worst thing to happen to cats since dogs. <laughs> <laughs> It's just absolute, but it's been bashed enough in the press. But I just wanted to hear your point of view, so I appreciate that. Um, anyone out there, please watch Cats. Let, let us know what you think no, <laughs> in the comments it below. You know, <laughs> it helps if you go into it maybe a little inebriated. Oh no, I'm halfway th- like in those first twenty minutes. I'm like, man, if I, and I don't, I don't drink or I don't smoke. I've never done drugs, but I'm like, if I was high, this would be <laughs> much better. Like I could, like if you're tri- if you're tripping. Again, have never tripped. But if if I could only imagine, like if I was tripping, this this movie would blow my mind. <laughs> it is it is one of those in the mood movies. Again, it, it, and the thing is, I'm also a huge fan of Andrew Lloyd Webber, who's uh, yeah, yeah. obviously wrote Cats. But Andrew Lloyd Webber, in his earlier years, you have to realize the guy was there was some weird stuff he put out. Oh. Really weird. Cats oh, yeah. is is in that category. <laughs> In that cat category. Hey, oh, hey, oh. <laughs> now I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions to ask all my guests. Yeah, sure. Uh, what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Oh my lord! Um, uh, I could be very, very facetious and say quit. <laughs> just, just run stop. away. Just stop. run away. Because if you follow that advice, then you probably made a good decision. <laughs> if you said no, John, you're an idiot. I don't want to listen to you. Then you probably have the right mindset for. <laughs> For sticking it out in this business because it is it is hard. I think but it'll be less facetious. I think is to to really understand what you're trying to, to put out there. Um, I think a lot of people get so so narrow. So they put the blinders on. They think about their project, their movie, and they think it's it is so perfect for everybody and everyone will love my movie because I'm the one that made it. And I actually had somebody put, send me a, a question the other day. He asked me what does what do they mean by target audience? And I, I had to ask myself like how how do you not understand well, your target. So I, so I just kind of went through went through with him. It's like, who does your movie ap- uh, appeal to? Who who do you think would want to see your movie? And I think that's if, if that's any advice, maybe it's just to understand not only like what what are you making your movie, uh, not necessarily for who you're making the movie, but or how how does it how does it fit in the larger world, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, and I, I and also realize too that you don't necessarily make movies for uh for the entire world. You sometimes you, a lot of the times you make a movie for yourself first. But also realize that fact that, that, you know, try to tie that into, I mean, I try that in, make, make the movie for yourself, but also realize that how to, how does that, how to appeal to other people, if that makes sense. Um, makes, makes it's, perfect. It's a so long, understand who your audience is basically and, yeah. and, tr- and try to create something for that audience um, is a good piece of advice. 
Yeah, and the thing again, the, the audience could be you too. I mean, you are in the audience. You are you are the first audience. So if it doesn't appeal to you, then obviously it's not. I mean, if it doesn't appeal to you, you're gonna have trouble appealing it to somebody else. And so. and three of your favorite films of all time. Oh, that's uh, Doctor Strange. Love is probably one of my favorites of all time. Um, I'm not gonna go Cats. <laughs> By what you may think, uh, it's not even near the top ten. Um, I'm trying to think of the uh, Doctor Strange Love is absolutely my favorite. Oh, uh, I love um, Some Like It Hot. Yeah, I just love. Oh, that's a great film. Such um, a great film. I was gonna pick another one that it's kind of a more of a smaller one. This is kind of what really inspired me to be a filmmaker. Is a movie called The Big Kahuna. Yeah, I remember the. I remember the Big Kahuna. Kevin Spacey. Yep. Danny DeVito and the guy that played the uh, one of the vampires on Twilight <laughs> oh. went on to. I yes, his name. I know who he's talking about. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's a and it's a it's a great little movie from the ni- late nineties. Uh, it's about these three salesmen that they get together and they're trying to land the big Kahuna, and it's entirely driven by conversation and entirely takes takes place in a single room, and it is some of the best performances I've ever seen on film. So that's that's I think that's one of my favorites. Very cool. I'm gonna put that out there. Now where and where can people find you? Uh, uh, filmmakeriq.com. I need to, I'm, I am redoing the website eventually. It's, it's a long process, but if you really want to find me, uh, youtube.com slash, I think filmmaker IQ is the, just look up filmmaker IQ. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can, you can chase me around on Facebook. I mean, I, I post more like personal stuff on Facebook, but between those two, that's really where you're going to see most of my face. And uh, Jeff- obviously on this podcast. John, I really appreciate it. Uh, you coming on the hey, show, man. Sure. Uh, we could talk for probably another two, three hours. Uh, oh, no, just, no geek- just geeking out alone on cats. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I really appreciate what you do, man, and, and all the education you put out there for um, for filmmakers out there. So thank you for doing what you do, my friend. Well, thank you for having me. I want to thank John for coming on the show and dropping his filmmaker IQ on the tribe today. Thank you so, so much, John. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, head over to the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 433. And guys, if you haven't already, please head over to FilmmakingPodcast.com and leave a good review for the show. It really helps us out a lot. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. Stay safe out there and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E dot com. 